Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, Tabor Talk. Boy, what a beautiful day. Uh, we really had an amazing summer here in the Catskills. So it's Saturday, September 12th. Yesterday was 9-11. Uh, okay, so getting right into this. Uh, so lately, I've been really on this Phil Donahue uh, kick. Uh, for the last couple, month, a couple of months, I've been going on YouTube and looking for old phil donahue shows i like to get the entire show you know it's kind of like a time capsule the entire show and with the commercials so phil donahue started his show 1967 in ohio he then went i think it was in the 73 went to chicago and then finally in the the mid 80s i believe he ended up and he went to new york and his career 29 years from 1967 to 1986 now check this out 7,000 shows. Try to imagine that. So on YouTube, there are only a few hundred, and they're really hard to find. So if you put in search, Phil Donahue, full episodes, whatever, you only come up with a hundred or two. But I've been being very creative and trying to find these hidden gems. So I got to tell you, Phil Donahue, second to none. Oh my God, was he great? Holy shit. You think of what we have today in journalism and media. Like, he's like, dude. Like, I listen to Joe Rogan. I love Joe. But boy, man, you're no Phil Donahue. Phil Donahue was just the best. I wish he was still around. By the way, I, I saw an, uh, a recent interview with him, well, a couple of years ago on MSNBC, and he was talking about Trump. I'll be doing a video about that. Had some pretty, pretty interesting things about our, our ridiculous president. He interviewed Trump three times on his show in the late 70s and a couple of times in 1983 and his last the last time I think it was 1988. And uh, I'll save that for another video. OK, getting right into this. I have a clip here from 1980, I believe. Um, and his guest is Father Andrew Greeley, who was an American, very famous, world famous American Catholic church who wrote many books. He was also a sociologist. OK, what makes this amazing is I got to tell you, one of the best interviews I've ever seen. It's 30 minutes long. And he asks all the questions that I would ask, but perhaps in a, in a much more eloquent way. Like, for example, celibacy. Why are Catholic priests celibate? Or this thing, like, why, why the theology, this ology stuff? Like, who the hell are you to tell me how to live? As if you have some special power. I've known guys who were, you know, very religious, and they read the Bible, who are these, uh, you know, like, hey, you should do this. You ought to do this. Like, who the hell are you? So... Uh, without further ado, let me just get right into this. Phil Donahue with Father Andrew Greeley. And by the way, I like F Father Andrew Greeley. He died in 2013, by the way. I wrote a note here. Um, so watch this interview on the Catholic Ch Church and all the questions you'd like to ask. There we go. Of celibacy is cruel and unnecessary. <laughs> That final commitment is made at 25, and indeed, oh. it's renewed. <laughs> it's renewed? Every day of your life, you renew but, it. Why? You don't need it. What do you need it for? If there is a voluntary group of males who want to use celibacy as a witness to the Lord, fine, let them do it. But to make it a prerequisite for celibacy is craziness. That's why we got so much trouble today. Well, I don't think the problems the church has are basically problems they have because of celibacy. In, in the book, I, you know, address myself to the question of why I'm a celibate and whether I would, if the situation was different and it was an option and I know what I knew now, would I still... And what do you say? Yeah, I say I think I would. You would. Okay, but that's for you. I, I, I well, you I mean, don't you, I mean, it's got to influence your personality. You can't possibly go to those cocktail parties with all those beautiful women without being a little crazy. Oh, I, it's not a promise not to enjoy beautiful women. You see, it, it would be an impossible commitment, though, if somebody wasn't happy as a priest. Uh, if you're happy as a priest, it's a form, to use the Freudian term of sublimation. You devote your energies in other directions. You have more people you can serve. You have more time to serve them. But it's, you, it speaks an anti-sect. 
it bespeaks an anti-sexual attitude. It bespeaks an, uh, an anti-female attitude. It's, a, it's, uh, it's really not benign. It's cruel and, and I think, um, destructive in its, own, in its own way. Well, but so can marriage be cruel and destructive. I don't think celibacy as such is cruel and destructive. It's, I, I am happy in, in the life I live. I'm very happy. Most priests I know are happy. We've given personality tests to priests and lay people, and priests score higher on the yeah, happiness. How come so many of them left then, Father? Well, I think those that left were those that weren't happy. But those were most of the people. Oh, no, it was only about 18%. Uh, under, under, under 40, what was it? Maybe 25%. And my feeling is, well, first of all, my solution to the priest problem is to invite people to be priests for a limited amount of time, for five or ten years renewable. And if they want to stay in, fine. Right. If they want to start a family, get married, fine, too. We're grateful to, the, to them right. for the years they've given us, which I think would make a lot of sense. Let me ask you a more, more basic question. Um, should, ology, should, should theology be an ology? In other words, what makes a person believe they have some special knowledge about God? Who do they think they are? I mean, how can one person know more about God than another person? Uh, I'm, I'm not a theologian. I'm a sociologist. But there are people out there who are claiming to well, be Well, all a theologian is, I think, is, is somebody who is a, a professor, an academic, who scientifically studies theology. He, he may not know anything personally about God. His personal life but, and his, his uh, professorial life are very different. But the, the body of scholarship upon which he draws, or she, is the contributions of people who were similarly finite, who preceded him or her, so that the so that the scholarship out there is the work of people who have to be honest and say they're not sure themselves. Hey, the, but the best best knowledge about God we have from our own personal experiences of God, yeah. and from the knowledge that, we, that others who've had these experiences share with us. So. Religion be is not theology. Religion begins in our experience of God, and we share it with other people in our stories of God. You find out about God from other people who've experienced him. Right. Then the theologians come along and reflect on that experience. And, and then I the bishops come along and pass rules, which are presumably sent down by God. Win a trip for four to the 13th annual Chicago Gospel Festival. Spot hey, let me say something. There's a big difference between Catholicism as rules and, and structure and doctrines you have to believe in Catholicism as a community and an experience of God and the stories we tell one another about God. Right. Nobody stays in the church because of the rules. Sex before marriage sometimes can be okay, true or false? We well, got him now, watch him squirt. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's true it's, or false. Sometimes sex before marriage. We're talking marriage. about rules, and, and if you're talking about the rule, the, there is a rule against it. Yes, uh, but, true. But sometimes before marriage, breaking that rule is okay, and in God's eyes, not a sin. Well, that's between God and the person. So and it's the possible confessor. then. It's possible. I, I, everything is possible. Well, then why have rules? Because the rules set up norms and guidelines for human behavior. But, but I, you know, Catholicism is not a series of negative sexual rules. Oh, I yes, it is. We were, oh, yes, it well, is. Some of us were taught that in school, but Catholicism really isn't that at all. The sexual ethics is part of the faith, but it's a peripheral part. The essence of the faith is an experience of God, sensibility about yeah, God. But that's rhetoric, Father, and everybody says that, essence of God. I think it's important, at least for people who are visible and influential, like yourself, to appreciate that out there are a lot, are millions and millions of Catholics who, who I think, in a very profound, faithful way, gave themselves to the church and now have been abandoned by that same church and, in effect, are listening to the liberal theologians out there saying, you didn't believe all that stuff, did you? And they did believe it. And the legacy is still there. And I think that that's a witness which is going unaddressed by the, well, by the, by the people today who go on television and talk about these all things. All I can say is I'm a sociologist and I've studied the reactions of the American Catholic population to the changes since the Vatican Council. They're overwhelmingly enthusiastic about it. Sure, people like you and I and other older folk. Less than 50% of Catholics go to Mass every Sunday. Where is this overwhelming Yeah, but, but over two-thirds of them go every once, at least once a month. So most Catholics don't uh, once a month. Well, that means they're in church. The number of people... And most of those are women. The women, it's like Latin no, America. The women go no, to church. that's not true. The men, men, women are a little more likely than men in the United States, but not much more likely. Uh, most uh, Catholics don't agree with this. Certainly practice birth control if, they, if that's their choice and they're in the yeah, childbirth. I'm, I'm the one done the research. Yes, yeah, 90% right. of right, them. All right, so what then, what, where is the church then? The church, the we church, aren't listening to the I mean, Pope. There's two ways of looking at the church. One is the institutional leadership, and that's important. The other is the community of the faithful, and that's important right. too. We have a breakdown in communication between the faithful and, yes, and the leadership. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Major 
major problem. Well, this is this is what uh, I assume you don't you support most of what Father Curran says. I th I not a theologian. I can't evaluate what he says theologically. Oh, come on, you you can. Uh, but let, uh, but let, let, me, let, let me let me let me finish. Let me finish. All right. But I think the way he's been treated has been shabby. I mean, the same people have been judged, jury, and executioner. And what they've done is taken an unknown, even by the Vatican's own principles, what they've done is counterproductive. They've taken an unknown theologian and made him a folk hero, because everybody in America supports him. Catholics who are divorced should be able to remarry. And, and you have to go through the expense of annulment process. Can't we get you to condemn that? Well, I'm not sure the endowment process is, it's not expensive, it only costs $1,500, 2000 people are out there paying it today. Uh, that's not in every right. case, but in yeah. any. Well, but why don't you, why are you so reluctant to condemn that? This, this man who bashes against the doors of the Vatican and the Chancery Office suddenly becomes... I think, you know, I think there are better ways of handling it than the endowment process. Well, but that's hard. I mean, if... the endowment process is, is, first of all, it's enormously improved. You now can get them rather easily. But why should they have to get them in the first place? Well, isn't it silly for a bunch of celibates to sit around and decide whether a marriage was well, existed not, or not? Well, you know, not all the people who sit around and decide are celibates. Uh, there are married people now. In but the but who do these people think they are, hey, presuming to know what's in hey, the... Don't back me into a corner where I look like I'm defending the present marriage discipline, because I think it ought to be changed. But I think it's better than it used to be. Homosexuals go to heaven, true or false? I'm sure they do. Uh, the church... Heterosexuals do, too. The, the church is... <laughs> But the church has a lot of explaining to do. The church is legitimizing homophobia by, by its pronouncements about homosexuals. It condemns, what is it, the, the act but not the sin but not the sinner? Um, is, I don't do you think support it's legitima that? Legitima legitimizing uh, homophobia. The, nobody except God can judge the guilt of an individual person. The, the church is teaching presently, which may not always be the case, but its present teaching is that, that homosexuality is in principle wrong. What do you think? In practice, if I was counseling somebody, I would do what most priests do and counsel them to stable, sustained relationships. Uh, and, and stable, sustained relationships can be homosexual. If, if, if the person you're counseling is homosexual, yeah. So a homosexual can engage in intimate behavior that is mutually gratifying and respectful of a partner, and you would support that in a, in a monogamous setting. Well, I said I would encourage somebody who is in that sort of situation to a stable relationship rather than unstable. So would any priest has any sense. And that stable relationship could be a homosexual stable yeah, relationship. Yeah, the man's a homosexual. And then yes. God looks upon that not, not with any anger or uh, I don't know punishment. how God would judge. I'm not God. But uh, God is a lot more merciful than most human beings. So in other words, oh, homosexuals should have mercy? No. God has mercy on all of us, including homosexuals. They, they're, not, they're not excluded because of they're, they're born with a different sexual orientation. They're not excluded from the dimensions of God's love. Mm. God's not a moral theologian. He's not even a bishop. <laughs> she isn't even a bishop, I should say. <laughs> Actually, she's Irish, Phil. And, but, and that, uh, but that is not uh, what, uh, the, that is not the legacy of Catholic theology. The legacy of Catholic theology is that God is a moral theologian, and he's watching every move, and you better shape up, or you, he, that, you don't know trouble until you get in trouble with God. God, God is the great accountant in the sky now with right. his own PC. Right, right. Well, some of us were raised that way. I just have to say that was a terrible distortion of the Catholic tradition. Either, you know, I wasn't particularly raised that way. But Chicago may have been, a, been different than a lot of other places in the country. Uh, but the Catholicism, God isn't a moral theologian. Catholicism isn't a rule. Uh, the Cardinal of uh, Chicago, Cardinal Bernadine, won't take your million bucks. Imagine that. He's I not, have a hard time I, I, you know, I do not have a pipeline, I promise you, to the Chancery in Chicago or anywhere. But my guess is he's not taking your million dollars because it's money that was generated by the sale of books which include what he might believe to be erotic uh, material that's unbe the unbecoming creative work of a priest. Uh, as you say, highly inappropriate for priests. Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't think that's a good reason for not taking money. I mean, the money is aimed at helping the poor kids in the black and Hispanic schools, the hardworking priests and sisters and nuns who staff those schools. And you could take the money for them and simply say, well, you know, we, we take the money, we don't approve this book, but we take the money. Uh, the, I think the reason that wasn't said, if indeed the books are his problem, was that that would, would offend and anger the people that read the books and don't think they're that way at all. And the overwhelming majority of the readers don't think they're steamy, don't think they're... You also, you're also suggesting that the Archdiocese of Chicago has accepted money from uh, a lot of evil people. Oh, I said the church has taken, not Union, just the Archdiocese. From, from Union Busters? Uh, well, I said the whole church is taking yeah. money from all kinds of different people. I, I may be a historical person. I may be the first one who's offered the church money 
and they turned it down. I don't want to go down in history for that, but I mean, I think I'm probably the first one that's done it. It's an interesting experience. The uh, book is titled Confessions of a Parish Priest. Its author is Andrew Greeley. We'll let this audience in on this, and we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> You know what? I was going to edit this and take out the commercials, but I think I'm going to leave them in. Um, the commercials from 1980, really interesting. The commercials, it really is a time capsule, you know? Uh, watch. Okay. Commercials are left in. Here you go. You can fast forward if you want, but whatever. Okay. <laughs> If you have a drinking problem, you probably have a disease, a progressive disease that weakens the structure of the family, that undermines the love that's the foundation of the family, that can tear the family apart and destroy everything you built together. A progressive disease called alcoholism. So next time you feel like reaching for a drink, reach for the phone instead. Call Care Unit. Nobody cares the way we do. Frank Doyle's coming on the noontime train. I need deputies fast. Can't offer you much, just my thanks and a ten star. That ain't gonna do it, Marsha. Okay, how about if I throw in some smooth, creamy Jello instant pudding? Can you have it ready in five minutes? Jello instant pudding, regular and sugar-free. Moms love it because it's made with milk. Kids just love it. I always wanted to be a lawman. The contest is over, and the winners are in in the TV18 U.S. Air C. Donahue Live contest. We congratulate the following winners who won a dinner for two at Sarge Biltz's in Lafayette. Now we present the grand prize winner. It is Deborah Faye McClure of Wolcott, Indiana. I seen the contest on the Donahue show, but I never thought I would win. Deborah wins a trip for two on US Air, nonstop to New York City to see the Donahue show live. We've never been on a plane trip before, and it'll be a lot of fun to go on US Air to New York. TV 18 and US Air thank everyone who entered the See Donahue Live contest. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Father Greeley. I was wondering what made you start writing these books. I've read a few of them, and I enjoyed them. Well, thank you. Uh, I started writing them because I was convinced, mainly by my sociological research, that religion is best shared with other people through stories. Uh, Jesus was a storyteller. The best parts of the Jewish scriptures are stories. We all love stories. And religion has been passed on in human history through stories. So these are all stories about God's love for us, how God's love pursues us through the lives of the people that we know and love. Yes, uh, yes. I'd like to know about the annulment. I had, to I had to fill out a form for my daughter that I would have to be a psychologist. I would have had to be in their bedroom on the honeymoon. And, I mean, it was unbelievable. <laughs> It's well, sinful I, what they're doing out there. They, they, the church gives you guilt and then charges you to take it back. I don't deal with annulments, and so I don't, re I don't want to defend them, and I don't know what the forms are like. As a sociologist, like. priest, visible media fellow who gets a lot more opportunity to speak to more people than most of the working priests in our beloved country, in any of our dioceses, I think, you'll pardon me, you have a responsibility to speak directly to these well, issues. I, you know, in other words, if you would condemn, if you would, I wish you were as enthusiastic about condemning the antiquated, self-conscious rules of the church as you are in condemning the people in high office, like Cardinal Bernadine and the Pope. Well, I haven't condemned either Cardinal Bernadine or the Pope. You call the Vatican incompetent. What, 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 well, what well, is yeah, that? I, it was in a context of talking about fundraising, and I say they're incompetent in financing the... the the Vatican runs on a budget not much larger than Georgetown University. One of the reasons the, the 
services over there are so inefficient is they don't have the money. They don't know how to raise funds. They're penny wise and pound foolish. That's the context in which I said they were inefficient. They're also inefficient and they don't understand the American people. They have no notion of what American society is like. And that's inefficient too. On the annulment thing, hey, you know, I say I don't like it. I mean, I'd like to see it changed. Um, there are very, very few parish priests in the country today. If a couple comes in and wants to get their marriage straightened out somehow or the other and don't want to go through the chancery office, there's very few priests who will insist that they go. I've read two of your books, Cardinal Sins and the one uh, relating to two priests, one who married while he was in the service. Uh, the message I got from that second novel was that you were in favor of priests marrying, which I happen to agree with. I happen to think that, that if you're going to counsel people, if you're going to counsel people, you have to experience that in order to help them. Well, I've done some research on the relationship between priests and people they counsel. And it turns out that for women and for their husbands, um, if they have a confidant relationship with a priest, it improves for both husband and wife the quality of their marriage relationship. So there is something special about a celibate that enables him to give a kind of counseling other people can't give. As my sister says, what makes people think that married men are all that sensitive to women either? Uh, I think it gives us a perspective. But, um, yeah, but it also gives you no soldiers in the ranks. You, are, you don't have enough priests. Oh, we'd have enough tomorrow if we'd ordain women, which I think we ought to do. I've read a lot of your books, and I was just wondering, why are your covers so provocative? I've uh, recommended them to people, and they look at me like I've got uh, well, I don't, dirty ideas or something. I don't think the covers are provocative, and, and the readers of the books don't think, I mean, ones in whom I've done research don't think they're provocative either. They think they're beautiful. The, the woman in the cardinal sins, huh? the, the half-naked back of a woman in the cardinal sins, that's, it's, it's a self-portrait by a very distinguished young American artist. It's hung in museums all around the country. It's good art. Yes, it attracts people to the book. That's what covers are for. But it's not exploitive, and, and it's not immoral. It's, it happens to be a good, attractive picture of womanly beauty. Oh, but, Father... <laughs> Phil? <laughs> Father, you, 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 deal with this, with, you deal with this criticism by saying it's, you don't believe it. I don't believe. Uh, you know, if father, that people, if father, your books are purient, and the co and the covers are erratic and not becoming. No, they're not. Next question. Well, I don't think they are. I mean, what more can I say? I, I don't think the cover of the Cardinal Sins, for example, father, yeah, it's erotic. I admit it's erotic. Life is erotic. I don't think it's pornographic or suggestive or inappropriate. I wonder how many priests, because of having to um, engage in celibacy, instead resort to other methods such as homosexuality amongst priests. What do you think? I think it's quite frequent that because they can't um, express their urges to women, they have to express them to other men. And this imposition of celibacy instead is making more and more priests into homosexuals. I don't think celibacy makes people homosexuals. Homosexuality is a personality orientation that comes very early in life. So I, I think there are some gay priests, probably more than there was at the time in the past, but I don't think they're typical. I think they're a minority, a small minority. Um, I'm from a religion, um, non-denomination, the Church of Christ, and we um, study out of the New Testament. I would like to know, um, does the Catholic Church, where are you taking your rules from, such as um, not, a priest not um, having a wife, because the Bible does not teach us that. You know, why uh, aren't you taking things directly from the Bible? It does not teach us that's contrary to the Bible, that you do, you know, it says, be fruitful and multiply. Well, first of all, there's lots of married... There's lots of married priests in the church. All the Greek Catholic priests are, are married. Uh, the, the Asian Catholic priests are married. It's only the Roman Catholic rite where there isn't a married clergy. And for a thousand years, most of them were married, too. So it's nothing against the religion. It happens to be an ecclesiastical rule. I, mean, I think, looking at my own life, I think I've done more good. Whatever good I've done would have been much more difficult to, to do if I had a family. But it's a rule that could be changed tomorrow. He's skirting the issue. He never answers the question directly. It's okay for one sect to be married, but not the other sect. It either is or it isn't. Yeah. And it's not, you know, no, what she I'm said. Sure it. I'm sorry if I can, if I can answer on that. Uh, it, it, it is all right for some dimensions of Catholicism because it doesn't happen to be a disciplinary rule. Uh, is it good or is it bad for priests to marry? Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not good. I mean, reality is gray. You can't... That, that still is not... You're not speaking to the issue, Father. Okay. Do you believe... Do you think... Do you want to continue 
the uh, the rule of celibate priesthood for the Roman Catholic faith. Yes. In other words, you can't. But be a I, it's priest. a rule that could be changed tomorrow too. It's, it, but you don't want to change it. He doesn't huh? want to change it. I want to change it. No, but I think it's a it's a what? it What's could be changed. He wants to remain celibate. He doesn't want everyone else to have to follow him. Yes, he does. He wants it to be Everybody a rule. Everybody wants to be a priest, but I think people should be asked to be a priest Wait a minute. for ten years. I was I was brought up to believe that priests are not supposed to be married. Now, if you're you, you if priests are going to get married, why can't they just hold a normal job like every other married person, have kids? I mean, I can't see a priest married. That's the way since I was born. You don't want to marry. No, I don't think they should get married. They're supposed to be, uh, you know, d dedicated to the church, not yeah. to wife. You don't want him talking. Well, you don't want him talking to his wife after you go to confession to him. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to know what you feel the benefits are of celibacy. Okay, I think there are three benefits. Uh, the first is that it frees you up to do more. It just gives you more time and energy. Then, then, then CEOs should be celibate. Talk show hosts should be <laughs> celibate. Just think how much better my show would be if I were celibate. Well, I don't, but talk show hosts and CEOs are not into intimate and intensive relationships with a large number of people as a parish priest should be. That's the first reason. Second reason is that, that celibacy is a sign. It stands for a world that transcends this one. Thornburg, nobody would have read the book. It never would have been a television story if it was about a married minister. About a priest who has a special commitment to God, who represents God in a special way, it becomes fascinating. Because Priests are by definition fascinating men. Now, we blow that off and don't live up to it. Our celibate commitment makes us different, unusual, and fascinating. The third reason is that I think that there always should be some people in the world who live in such a way they show they can love uh, their fellow human beings, love people of the opposite sex, without having to jump into bed with them. Those, to me, are the three persuasive jump reasons for celibacy. Jump into bed with them. Listen to your language. <laughs> jump into bed with them. Sex is something you, you have when you jump into bed. That's dirty, Father, no. and that's not the kind of sex we're talking about. Talking. We don't want you jumping. I wish you had said the sack, jumping into the sack. That's even better. We would, some, some Catholics would pray for the day that a priest might, if it be his choice, enjoy the wonderful experience of mutually satisfying intimacy with the person that he loves. You can't believe how neat it, and wonderful it can be. Oh. It'll make you a better person. I can believe it'd be very neat and wonderful, so I don't have any doubt about that. My stories are often about that. But, but it doesn't follow that, that, that because a person doesn't do that, he, is, he's, he ceases to be a human being. On the contrary, the, all the evidence that we have uh, from the research is that the Catholic lay people value the, the celibate priest as a counselor, as a consultant. Now, half the Catholic laity would also accept a uh, married priest. So my, my present position yeah. Wanting women to be ordained, but wanting priests to continue to be celibate, that, that's a minority opinion in Catholicism. Now. Father, you believe in celibacy. Yeah. I believe in God. I would like, just I like to God. know, how do you get such wonderful books written and so explicit without experience? Yeah. Uh, I guess well. I have a good imagination. Very good imagination. Thank I you. love your books, sir. God bless you. You heard what I said, Phil? said she loved my book. You heard that? Uh, uh -huh. I love your books, too, but the most disquieting thing I have ever run across was a priest that I met about 15 years ago who was dating a Protestant woman and told me it was okay because she wasn't Catholic, and that bothered me. <laughs> yeah, I, it would bother me, too. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And we'll be back in just a moment. It's about the biggest scoop you've ever seen. A full quarter pound of Queen's Choice Ice Cream. Big Scoop. Dairy Queen, an American original, introduces the Queen's Choice Big Scoop Cone. A full quarter pound, hand-dipped, only 49 cents. Flavored with a Heath or Butterfinger bar, the list goes on. Just 49 cents. It's about the biggest scoop you've ever seen. A quarter pound Big Scoop at Dairy Queen. An American original. We treat you right. Home is where the heart is, especially when you're sick. Convacare rents and sells hospital equipment to use in your home, and while you're recovering, Convacare files your insurance claim promptly and accurately. They know Medicare, and they want you to receive all the benefits you have coming under your insurance program. 
because home is where the heart is, rent or buy hospital equipment from one of these Convicare centers. Wells Jaeger Best in Lafayette, Dexter Pharmacy in Logansport, Denny's Pharmacy in Fowler, Goodland, and Otterburn. Bill DeFau says, listen. Listen to the heartbeat. Economy cars, performance cars, luxury cars, trucks, vans. Feel the heartbeat of America. Chevrolet. Let's Chevrolet. The 87s are here now at Defau and Lafayette. For the past few months, we at News Service 18 have been talking about local people covering local stories. And you might ask, doesn't every TV station cover Lafayette? Well, the answer is no. What we do here is something no one else does. Our reporters live here. This town and the surrounding area is our only beat. And so when there's news that affects Lafayette, whether it's local government schools, local football scores, or the area weather forecast, we've got it seven nights a week. News Service 18, local people covering local stories. I assume you think it's okay to practice birth control and still be a good Catholic. 90% of American Catholics think so. 90% of the priests think so. But I asked him about him, what he thought. If you want to find out what I think, Phil, you're going to have to come to confession to me. Because that's where I give advice on, on, on those issues. And I give him a very light penance. One Our Father and one Hail Mary. He goes to confession. Not publicly, after look, the look, show. There are women in the third world who are being told by the papacy that they cannot protect themselves from pregnancy in an environment that does not reach out and help a family raise a child. Don't expect me so to So this is not that. a small question. It's so that when not. a leading Catholic person steps forward in 1986, a person who has a reputation for banging up against the barnacles of the church establishment declines to answer that question on television, you'll no. forgive us for, for being just a little bit impatient with your coyness here. <laughs> I don't. Tell the, life's too short to go through it without saying what you mean. Why don't you tell us how you feel about the church's okay, admonition regarding think, birth control? I think the birth control attitude is the result of men not understanding how important sex is for healing and renewing married love. And that's in the Vatican. The parish clergy and the laity made up their mind on that issue a long time ago. It's not an issue for them anymore. Um, and, and the problem is the Vatican doesn't listen to the lay people's experience of sex and marriage before it makes decisions. It thinks it knows what's going on among the laity, and it does not. And that's why we have the problem. Oh, Father, I want to know if you think it's a sin to want to have sex and not have it. That's what I want to know, too. <laughs> if you lust in your heart, do you, I, if you lust... It's a sin. It was when I was in high school. <laughs> it, was, it was called bad thoughts. You know, Bless me, Father, I had 38 bad thoughts since my last confession. People, I could get warm just thinking about my bad thoughts before uh, going to confession. People used to come to confession and say I had 38 bad thoughts, but I didn't take pleasure in them. And I'd always wonder, why have them? <laughs> if there's no pleasure well, in them, why have them? They're not bad if they're not any fun. The human uh, race is designed to desire members of the opposite sex. There is nothing immoral with those feelings or desires or emotions at all. Tell the Pope to say that. Well, I, I think the Pope has said it, but so obscurely that those people don't understand. Why does he always speak to issues that deal in the trenches with the people so obscurely? There's nothing obscure about his rule against uh, female priests. Oh, I guess the ending was kind of an abrupt ending there, and uh, I'm not sure I could find the last five minutes or so. But uh, how about that? Just terrific. Uh, so, okay, on that note, good friends, good books, and a sleepy conscience, peace, love, and understanding here on Tabor Talk. And boy, is the Catholic Church in trouble now. Okay.